David, 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 come on, David. Wake on, up, make your trout in my video. Wake the fuck up! <sighs> About what? Wasn't it dark outside? Gosh. No, but seriously, about what? Everything's already been covered. I mean, Will's made 10 billion videos. Everybody else has made at least one. I cannot think of what to do. I don't think anyone talked about any big finish. Ooh, that, um, that new box set came out. Maybe I could talk about this. You know, Michael Troughton does actually a really good job. It was this in The Annihilators, and now he's pretty much just... Two for big finish. I reckon his dad'd be proud, you know. Wait, Michael. Oh, and David. Yes! The other Troutons, his sons! Oh. It's Trouton Month after all. How about we let the other Troutons shine? Well, I think the most fitting place to start is their involvement with TV Doctor Who, and for the sake of some type of structure in this video, let's start with David. David Trouton's first on-screen appearance is apparently in The Enemy of the World. He plays one of the background guards, and I believe it's inside Salamander's Mansion? Though I've never been able to find him. Although I could totally believe that he's there. And now onto something with some substance. The War Games features David Trouton's first named role in the Doctor Who universe, playing Private Moore, a British soldier from the American Revolutionary War. When it is revealed to him and the rest of the soldiers that they have been trapped in a simulation of war, they forge a resistance and even capture one of the enemy's leaders, Von Weyck. Moore is left to guard Von Weyck, and it is here that we gain an understanding of his character. Moore lacks confidence, he stutters over his words, and he fails to be assertive. During this scene where he is the guard, it is made very clear to the audience that he is not the one in charge. How long do you intend keeping me here? Until they come back. And supposing they don't come back? I'd like some water. All right. Sit down. We can infer a lot of his character from this. Maybe he was an unwitting soldier, or perhaps when faced with an unfathomable concept of the war games, it begins to affect his confidence in a way normal warfare wouldn't. This, granted, is all just speculation for a side character, but with Troughton's excellent performance, it can leave the audience wanting, well, more of more. Moore's characterization, despite the little screen time he has, is that of a sympathetic one, and with the Second World War being a very close memory for many, having only ended 24 years prior, it would likely have further compelled the audience to empathise with this unwitting soldier, scared out of his wits, that keeps going anyway to eventually conquer the evils. Next up on the list is Peladon from The Curse of Peladon, or to give him his full title, Peladon Peladon of Peladon, because for some reason, Peladon is the name of the character, name of the planet, and title of the monarch. Funny and confusing naming scheme aside, this is probably David Troughton's largest and most famous role in the franchise, as he plays a key part in the story as it progresses, being at the centre of the conflict and the political intrigue. The story begins not long after the death of Peladon's father and current ruler, and as such, Peladon is hurriedly crowned king before he is remotely ready for the task, and one of the first acts he commits to as king is to invite delegates from the Galactic Federation to the planet to discuss potentially becoming a member. Then the conference must be cancelled! This is not a matter to trouble the delegates. Torbis, my former chancellor, died earlier tonight in mysterious circumstances. But the truth will be brought to light. Meanwhile, there is no danger to you or to your fellow delegates. Throughout the story, the new monarch must contend with two opposing ideals, the more progressive and forward-thinking ideas of the Chancellor Torbis, or the more traditional old world view of High Priest Hepesh. He faces the bickering of the two men who helped raise him regarding how they should advance, and through it all he is ridden with his own self-doubt regarding his choices and ability to rule. 
He also struggles with issues of the heart. Throughout the story, he begins to develop feelings for Joe. He finds himself at multiple points confessing his frustrations to her for the reasons I don't think even he fully understands. Do you believe me? I'm only an observer. It's up to the committee to decide whether or not to help you. I'm talking from a personal point of view. I don't often get the chance. Even to a point of confessing his own attraction. I was brought up by wise old men. I hardly ever see anyone young or beautiful. My mother was an earth woman. So you see, there is a bond between us. Do you believe me? If not to throw it all away. Make them see my case. I see. All you want is a political ally. No, I want you as a friend. Peladon is desperate to make the negotiations a success. Even after multiple assassination attempts on multiple parties, we see him become more confident in his authority and wishes to assist our heroes, even if his arm may occasionally be twisted by traditions that even he doesn't agree with. Hepesh is right. I am powerless to save him. I'm begging you. Please. He grows to a point where, even later in the story, after he's been betrayed by one of the men instrumental in his upbringing with a sword to his neck, he remains steadfast. Something that could definitely not be said for the Peladon we meet at the beginning. Hepesh. I thought you would bring me the crown of kingship. Are you going to bring me death instead? You will become a stranger to me, Paladin. Return to the ancient ways of our people, and you will live on, our beloved king. If not, the royal line of Paladin must meet an ignoble end. So yeah, he's a great character with a short but satisfying arc, and that's great. But can I take a second to gush about how good the chemistry between him and Joe is? It's wonderful, and genuinely, I would honestly say she has better chemistry with Peladon than she does with Cliff. I'm not even a real princess. That doesn't matter. Oh, Peladon. But enough of that mushy nonsense. Let's move on to his final Doctor Who appearance 36 years later in 2008's Midnight, where he plays Professor Winfield Hopps, a man who's dedicated his life to the study of the planet Midnight which surely makes his involvement in this story very interesting. We learn quite a bit about him in his first few scenes. He is very reliant on his assistant. He thinks he's the most interesting person in the room and that everybody would want to meet him. Hobbs, Professor Winfold Hobbs. I'm the doctor, hello. It's my 14th time. Oh, my first. And I'm Dee Dee, Dee Dee Blasco. No, don't bother the man. He really enjoys sharing his knowledge regarding his studies with a flair for the dramatic. X tonic rays, raw galvanic radiation. Dee Dee, next slide. It's my pet project. Actually, I'm the first person to research this because you see. The history is fascinating. And he's incredibly stubborn, as when the creature attacks the vessel, he remains obstinate to his view that no life could possibly exist, as it threatens the years of research he has done up until that point. For the last time, nothing can live on the surface of midnight. Professor, I'm glad you've got an absolute definition of life in the universe, but perhaps the universe has got ideas of its own. Hmm? All of this works wonders in explaining exactly who he is, and every action he takes later is informed by this setup. Nothing he says or does feels at all jarring to the character that has been established at this point. And all of this is accomplished whilst establishing every other character in the story within the first five minutes or so. This in turn means that his eventual actions later on feel as though they could realistically happen. For example, when the creature first possesses Sky, both he and the Doctor are inquisitive, maintaining that scientific curiosity that must come naturally with years of study. I'd say, uh, from observation, uh... The Doctor can't move, and when she was uh, possessed, she couldn't move, so... Well, there we are then. Or later on, when his authority is questioned, and Dee Dee is being smarter than him in this instance, and due to his self-important nature and his stubbornness, his first instinct is to not listen to reason, 
but instead to belittle her in a desperate bid to maintain his superiority. You should be quiet, dear. Well, I'm only saying... And that's an order! You're making a fool of yourself pretending you're an expert in mechanics and hydraulics when I can tell you you are nothing more than average at best. Now, shut up! And throughout all of this, David is giving a spectacular performance, where it can be easy to look past a lot of Professor Hobbes' more nasty traits because he is just so charismatic and every word he says is believable. Not to mention that he has my favourite line delivery of any character in the story. The hostess. What was her name? I don't know. What a phenomenal actor, and what a phenomenal track record. All of the stories he appeared in are some of my all-time favourites, even one where he's just an extra. Seemingly, David Troughton and Doctor Who are like a match made in heaven. I wonder if Michael got the same treatment. He didn't. Michael Troughton has only ever made one televised Doctor Who appearance, and that is in the 2014 Christmas special, where he plays... Um... Uh, ah, yeah, Professor Albert, that's it. So, what does Professor Albert bring to the table? Well, he's a pervert. Till he put his hand on my knee, and then I was just grossing. It was intended as a comfort. For whom? Uh, he eats turkey at one point. Merciful, I suppose. Compared to what? Compared to that turkey leg you keep eating. Could you rewind for me? I'd like to see- He does a lot of standing around in the background of scenes. Oh, he's watched Alien. They're a bit like face huggers, aren't they? Face huggers? Oh, you know, Alien. The horror movie, Alien. And then he gets eaten by a monitor. <laughs> there is nothing of substance to Professor Albert. Nothing at all. That isn't to say that the other characters are particularly well defined, but they do at least have some characteristics. Professor Albert, on the other hand, has a few jokes. It sort of leads me to believe that he may have been a last minute inclusion, just to get Michael Troughton in, because the Troughton name means a lot in the Doctor Who circles. But, yeah. Not at all the fault of Michael, of course. He does a really good job with the very limited material, but not much you can really do with a script like Last Christmas. Well, now I have to keep going. I don't really want to end this on a low note, so I guess now we'll discuss audio. Firstly, I want to discuss the audiobooks of the Target novels, as David is one of the most prolific narrators of Second Doctor books, reading The Abominable Snowmen, The Enemy of the World, The Web of Fear, Fury from the Deep, The Wheel in Space, The Invasion, and The War Games. And on top of that, he also read The Curse of Peladon. Michael, on the other hand, only did one audiobook reading, being for The Dominators. Okay, but now onto the audio productions people actually care about. Starting with David, he has had a few consistent roles in the past with Big Finish, the first of which is the reprisal of his role as King Peladon, having two appearances as the character, first of these in the companion chronicle The Prisoner of Peladon, and the second in the recent special release box set titled, well, Peladon. And his performance as an older and wiser Peladon is excellent, with his optimism for a brighter future for Peladon is ceaseless. <laughs> Welcome, my friends, to Peladon, a proud planet where the eyes of the people are set firmly on the future. The second of his roles is actually a recast, as he plays the Black Guardian across many ranges, where if the character is needed for a story, then they use David. Whilst I have not heard any of the stories and therefore cannot pass judgement on his performance, I find the idea of David playing the Black Guardian to be fascinating, and I really should get around to giving those stories a go. Then there are the other side characters that he has played across the years. As for Michael, much like their TV appearances, his big finish roles are currently lesser than that of his brother. Not in quality, but in quantity. He did play a recurring villain named Men Love Stokes in both The Romance of Crime and The Well-Mannered War, the latter of which is also the only story to feature both of the Troughton brothers. And he has made other appearances across many ranges as one-off characters, my favourite of which being Quendrill from Lords of the Red Planet. However, there is something that Michael does have over his brother, and that is, as of the release of the Beyond the War Games box set, he is now the second Doctor for Big Finish, a role that he will continue to hold for presumably quite some time. And out of all the second Doctor impressionists that we've had over the years, I think he might be my favourite. It does help that Michael by default does sound a good amount like his dad, but he manages to accurately capture many of the little aspects that make us love his Doctor so much. This is what we need! 
Somewhere out there is Celestine. Celestine? You're not making any sense. The Time Lord who piloted this TARDIS here. And by somewhere out there, you mean that city you saw? Very likely, I'm afraid. Oh, this just gets better all the time. This is a personal retrieval system. A homing device that should point us in the right direction. The Troughton legacy is a mighty one, with the brothers making Doctor Who appearances from as far back as 1968 to the modern day, and heck, even Pat's grandson's been in a big finish. Granted, not a Doctor Who one, but I imagine it's only a matter of time. It would seem that the Troughtons always have a home in Doctor Who, which makes sense, given the fact that Patrick essentially saved the franchise. It's almost like their way of paying them back. And as long as we keep getting stellar performances out of it, I'm happy the Troughtons are here to stay. Ooh. Mm -hmm.